The assassination of President John F. Kennedy changed Dallas, the state of Texas, the United States of America, and the world. It's amazing to think that locations associated with this history still exist, and that there are people who were there to witness it that are still around to tell their stories. This week, it's a very different episode of Expedition Texas, as we retrace the steps of Lee Harvey Oswald in the 48 hours he lived after the assassination of John F. Kennedy. Texas is full of lost history. From lost cemeteries to abandoned buildings. From the infamous to the obscure. Hitch a ride and travel across the Lone Star State, looking for hints of Texas' colorful past. Our lost history. This is Expedition Texas, and we're gonna find it. This story has been told many times from every imaginable angle, and it will be told that way for years to come. In this episode, we won't attempt to retell this story. We're just going to tell you what happened and take you back to the locations where it all took place. History has been kind to John F. Kennedy, though at the time of his presidency, there were sharp differences in opinion over his policies. This is what led a man named Lee Harvey Oswald to do the unthinkable on November 22, 1963. The president was in Dallas where the excitement would peak as he would make his way through downtown in an open-top car just feet from thousands of adoring Dallas onlookers. As his car entered Dealey Plaza and passed the building known as the Texas School Book Depository, shots rang out. Suddenly, those onlookers became witnesses to the murder of John F. Kennedy. Today, we travel back to some of the places burned in the memories of Americans and even talk to some who were there. We start off by meeting up with this man, Stephen Fagan, associate curator at the Sixth Floor Museum. Lee Harvey Oswald was an order filler uh, in this building, a temporary employee hired in October of 1963. And the morning of the assassination, he was 24 years old. He uh, was in the midst of a disintegrating marriage. He had what you might describe as a confused political ideology, and he arrived at work that morning with a package wrapped in brown paper. He said that they were curtain rods for his rooming house in the Oak Cliff section of Dallas. Uh, at 12.30 p.m., shots were fired at President Kennedy's motorcade as it passed through Dealey Plaza, and Lee Harvey Oswald was first seen on the second floor of the building in the lunchroom about 90 seconds after the last shot was fired. He was uh, approached by a Dallas motorcycle patrolman named Miriam Baker who drew his gun, uh, but the building superintendent, Roy Truly, was there with Baker and he identified Oswald as an employee of the building. That satisfied Baker who holstered his weapon and they went on up the stairs searching for uh, a possible assassin in the building. After they left Oswald there in the lunchroom, Oswald bought a Coke from the vending machine and walked out the front door of this building about three or four minutes after the assassination. After exiting the front door of the Texas School Book Depository, Oswald simply walked up Elm Street several blocks and got on a Dallas City bus. But as you can imagine, following not just the presidential parade, but the shooting in Dealey Plaza, traffic was backed up quite a bit. And so after about two blocks, Oswald got a transfer ticket and got off the bus. He walked uh, down Lamar Street to the Greyhound bus station where he was able to get a taxi. And the taxi took him down Houston Street towards the uh, Houston Street Viaduct over into the Oak Cliff section of Dallas. Coming up next, we tour the Sixth Floor Museum with Stephen and meet up with some living history. It was still a very upbeat thing, and all of a sudden, the first two shots rang out. It was something like boom, boom, about like that. I was just terrified. You know, I thought, uh, I looked around and there was people with guns drawn, the yeah. Secret Service. Right. And I was afraid that we were going to get in a crossfire or my kids were going to get killed. I was just oh, panicky. Terrified. Mm -hmm. It was a scary situation. President Carter, 
car is now turning onto Elm Street, and it will be only a matter of minutes before he arrives at the trademark. I was on Simmons Freeway earlier, and even the freeway was jam-packed with spectators waiting their chance to see the president as he made his way towards the trademark. It, it, it appears as though something has happened in the motorcade route. Something, I repeat, has happened in the motorcade route. There's numerous people running up the hill alongside Elm Street, there by the Simmons Freeway. Several police officers are rushing up the hill at this time. Stand by just a moment, please. Something has happened in the motorcade route. Stand by, please. Parkland Hospital, there has been a shooting. Parkland Hospital has been advised to stand by for a severe gunshot wound. I repeat, a shooting in the motorcade in the downtown area. Parkland Hospital has been advised to stand by for a severe gunshot wound. We're in Dallas, Texas, where we've met up with Stephen Fagan, who, in his role as associate curator at the Sixth Floor Museum at the Old Texas School Book Depository Building, is a bit of a historian about the locations we want to visit associated with the path of Lee Harvey Oswald after he took the life of President John F. Kennedy. First, we want to explore the museum with Stephen. The Sixth Floor Museum is designed to educate visitors about a historic moment in time and, of course, honor the legacy of President Kennedy. This is the sixth floor of the Texas School Book Depository, and we're stepping out of the external elevator shaft and crossing what we call the hyphen. It's really a sky bridge connecting the elevator shaft to the exterior of the School Book Depository building, and this was a window in 1963, and this is how we access the museum. All right, so here on the wall is something that thousands of people walk by every year, but hardly anyone notices. There are some original stamps here from John Sexton and Company when this was a grocery wholesaler warehouse from 41 to 61. And when they left the building, apparently some of the employees uh, stenciled their mark on really? the walls. Uh, so this was uh, just random employees. That Old Sexton. Old Sextonites never die, they just fade they away. Work. Yeah, which was the company slogan, apparently. <laughs> And then right next to that is something else that a lot of people miss. This is the original freight elevator that was in use on November 22nd, 1963. Oh, wow. As an employee, Lee Harvey Oswald would have used this elevator as part of his uh, daily work routine. And it's permanently fixed here on the sixth floor level because with the rest of the building being uh, county operations, the elevator shaft is gone from the, sixth, from the uh, floor below us. So this... Uh very easily could have been went the way he rode up to work. Yeah, uh, since he was employed here in October of 63, he would have undoubtedly used this elevator uh, several times as part of his normal daily routine. Well, our museum really explores the life, death, and legacy of President Kennedy within the context of 1960s history and culture. And we tell that story through hundreds of photographs and uh, videos and artifacts that we share with visitors from around the world. Well, we are here in the southeast corner of the Texas School Book Depository, and this is the Sniper's Perch. Uh, the, the original wood floor is still here, and some of the brickwork is original, and the light fixtures are original, and this scene, uh, the arrangement of these boxes has been recreated based on the way it looked in the Dallas Police crime scene photographs taken following the assassination. These monitors actually offer uh, a computer representation of the assassination, so you can follow it out the window here. Dealey Plaza is a National Historic Landmark District, and it's actually changed very little in the 52 years since the assassination. So looking out this window, uh, you can really get a sense of the history of this emotionally charged space by, wow. uh, by seeing the exact movements of the vehicle as it made this fateful turn from Maine to Houston and Houston on to Elm. reports here at Parkland that Governor Connolly was shot in the upper left chest and the first unconfirmed reports say the president was hit in the head. That's an unconfirmed report that the president was hit in the head. The president's wife, Jackie Kennedy, was not hurt. She walked into the hospital at her husband's stretcher side. And a Dallas newsman, Mal Couch, said he was riding shortly behind the president in the parade. He said after the shots were fired, he happened to look up at about the fifth or sixth floor of the Texas Book Depository. He said he saw the rifle being pulled back in. We're in 
in Dallas, Texas, where we've met up with Stephen Fagan. Our tour with Stephen was cut short by some special guests who just happened to be touring the museum with some out-of-town friends that day. Bill and Gail Newman were depicted in famous photos and film on the ground covering their children after the shots rang out. They later became witnesses for the Dallas Police Department and the FBI investigating the assassination. And today, we had a chance to visit with them. Well, we're actually joined today by the two closest civilian eyewitnesses to President Kennedy at the moment of his death in 1963, Bill and Gail Newman. And, and this is kind of a privilege because of being able to talk to you and ask you what it was like that day here in Dealey Plaza. Did you know immediately what was happening? Actually not, Robert. Uh, I can recall hearing the parade coming down uh, uh, Main, uh, Main, I mean, uh, yeah, Main Street. Uh, the cheering of the crowd, it was more of a festive yeah. feel at that moment. But then I also recall seeing the president's car turn right onto Houston and mm -hmm. travel that short block and then turn left onto Elm. And we were standing along the curb's edge and uh, it was still a very upbeat thing and all of a sudden the first two shots rang out. It was something like boom, boom, about like that. And Robert, actually, I thought somebody had thrown a couple of firecrackers beside the president's car. You know, and I was kind of startled at that. And I thought, well, that's really a poor joke for someone to play. Right. But as the car got closer to us, you could tell something was wrong. You could see uh, the president looking into the crowd in our direction, and you could see uh, the protruding eyes on Governor Connolly. And as the car got closer to us, uh, you could see the blood on his shirt, and he was sort of stretched out in a jump seat. And when the car passed right in front of us, about as close as I am to your cameraman, maybe a little further, the third shot rang out. And I remember seeing the side of his head come off, and uh, just a blast of white, and then the red uh, coming out. And I turned to Gail, I said, that's it, hit the ground. And we turned and throwed our two children down the ground and, and covered them. Because the sensation that went through me at that moment was that third shot had come over the top of our heads. Yeah. And uh, not to confuse anybody that actually thought the shot came from straight behind. It was just the physical reaction that President Kennedy yeah. had to the shot. Right. That, I don't think any time down through the years in hearing this story I've ever gotten chills. But right now, hearing you tell it from your proximity and, and being there, I just got chills because that's, and that's because it, it puts a it puts a personal uh, story to it, you know. And what was it like for you? You're you're there. You're there to see the president, and then you see this, and your kids are there. Your, yes. your motherly instincts had yes, to kick in. Yes, my motherly instincts did kick in. Our children were two and four. And, uh, you know, I'm sure that I was leaning down, talking to him and saying, the president's coming and, and everything. And then when that happened, I mean, I'd never been around gunfire or anything. And Bill said, that's it, hit the ground. And we put him down and I, uh, I shielded Bill with, with my body and he shielded Clayton. And I was just terrified. You know, I thought, uh, I looked around and there was people with guns drawn the yeah. Secret Service, right? and I was afraid that we were going to get in a crossfire or my kids were going to get killed. I was just oh, panicky. Terrified. Mm -hmm. It was a scary situation. How did that day change you two? Robert, that's hard to say. You know, people have asked us that question many times. Uh, the, the simple answer is that we met a lot of people we wouldn't uh, have met otherwise. Uh, probably the reality of that day was that, you know, we're, we're all mortal and, and he, we just take life as a guarantee sometimes when probably we should live life one day at a time. Yeah. Now, maybe, uh, maybe I grew up a little, a little bit that day. We were very young. We were ch children raising children at that time. But uh, I, I think it uh, makes you accept your mortality when you see something like that. And as McDonald got closer, Oswald moved down to the second seat in the row. We're in 
in Dallas, Texas, exploring locations associated with Lee Harvey Oswald in the moments after the assassination of President John F. Kennedy. After the shooting, Oswald left Dealey Plaza and returned to his boarding house in Oak Cliff. There he retrieved a pistol and left on foot. Near the corner of 10th and Patton, he was approached by Officer J.D. Tippett. We travel with our guide, Stephen Fagan, to the site of that encounter. So we're walking through a residential neighborhood right now that's also school property here, but this location is where Oswald had that altercation with Officer J.T. Tippett. Right, exactly. We're here uh, near the intersection of 10th and Patton Streets in Oak Cliff, and it was right across the street here that the shooting of Officer J.D. Tippett took place. So right over here in this area here is where... Yeah, um, Tippett was coming east on 10th Street and he observed Oswald walking on the sidewalk and there was something about Oswald that prompted him to stop Oswald to talk to him. So they had a brief exchange uh, with the window rolled down on his car and then at some point Tippett got out of the car and was walking around the front of his police car and when he got about even with the, the, the front of the police car, Allegedly, Oswald then opened fire and shot Tippett multiple times. Tippett fell on the ground and uh, and died. Yeah. Oswald then went down Patton Street and uh, made his way over to the Texas Theater. There were multiple eyewitnesses to the Tippett shooting, and uh, a couple of them were able to positively identify Oswald as the gunman. Really? Well, that's uh, so. The next stop is the Texas Theater, right? Which is where we're headed next. Okay. All right. So we're walking down Jefferson and this would have been the path that Oswald took on his way to the Texas Theater and I always thought that he went straight to the Texas, but you're saying that's not what happened, right? No, he made a stop right here at what was Hardy's Shoe Store in 1963. A police car coming down Jefferson um, attracted Oswald's attention and so he immediately stepped into this alcove and faced away from the street looking towards the, the display cases here. And once the police car had made a U-turn and disappeared from sight, Oswald then uh, went back out onto Jefferson and Brewer decided to exit his store and follow him down Jefferson to see what he was up to. And so that he continued walking down Jefferson and he didn't realize it but Johnny Calvin Brewer was walking behind him following him. So Oswald made his way here to the Texas Theater and uh, this red patch of ground here is where the original ticket booth was and a woman named Julia Postal was here and she was distracted by the police cars coming down Jefferson and Oswald was able to come right around the corner, sneak past her and go in those doors without buying a ticket. Brewer approached Julia Postal, asked if a man just bought a ticket. She said no, and he said, you better call the police. So the police were called, and they all converged on the Texas Theater. And this is uh, about 1.45 in the afternoon. Hi. Well, I'm Walton. This is Stephen. Hi. Nice Hi. To see you. And we're here to see the location where Lee Harvey Oswald was arrested and taken in after assassinating President Kennedy. Well, you're in the right spot. So the row Oswald was sitting in would have been right about here. Three rows of seats were removed uh, since then. Where did they go? Third row from the back. Uh, well, on the sides, they were removed in 65 to make way for cry rooms. Uh, the ones back here, because it didn't really balance, were removed in a later renovation to add a platform for the lights and sound boards. So, actually, Oswald would have been about here. Yes, sir. But, to give folks the idea, yeah. Come with me, Stephen. I want to. I want to get down here to give folks an idea. He was one, two, three, four, five, five seats in, right? Mm -hmm. So. Officer's walking his way. Yeah, so Officer Nate McDonald is working his way up. He knows Oswald is in this row. He's been pointed out uh, from the stage by Johnny Calvin Brewer, okay. who was trailing him outside. And as McDonald got closer, Oswald moved down to the second seat in the row. So why do you think he did that? Well, it, it see, well it, it's possible he may have been thinking about giving, you know, making a run for it, but at the same time, it seems like a really foolish move because he's simply drawing attention to himself by, uh, by moving while the house lights are up. The locations seared into the memories of Americans on that day in 1963 are for the most part still in existence. You can visit the Sixth Floor Museum, you can visit the marker honoring Officer J.D. Tippett, and you can see a show at the Texas Theater. This is the amazing thing about Texas history. We tend to preserve it and revisit it. Down the road there's another lost legend waiting to be discovered, and on Expedition Texas, we're going to find it. <laughs>